Hi, everybody. I'm Anthony, and I'm from Uber. I'm our general manager for our Eastern European business. And I just have a few slides uh, today to share a little bit about the Uber history, our background, how we came to be the business that we are today, talk a little bit about some interesting developments in our Polish market, specifically today, and then also some global developments that we're doing. And then lastly, share a few insights that I have from my time at the business uh, over the past few years. So the idea for Uber came about on, at, um, after a, an entrepreneurship conference in 2008 in Paris called The Web. Our co-founders, Travis Kalanick and Garrett Camp, were standing outside trying to hail a cab. Um, uh, and it was snowing. And, and they, they were having really, really a, a lot of trouble getting a car. So they thought to themselves, wouldn't it be amazing if I could open my phone, press a button, and then magically a car would arrive? This super simple idea um, uh, they, they, they took and they launched and, and they moved it forward. And I think never in their wildest dreams would they have imagined that it would, be one of, it would develop into one of the fastest growing startups around the world um, and today operate in more than 400 cities and 70 countries around, uh, around the globe, um, doing more than 1 billion rides on the platform. They first launched the first cars in the system in 2010. And I think very interestingly then, um, they launched a black car service, which is really a, a premium product. The idea was that Uber will provide this luxury, high-end uh, experience for you at a price far more cost-effective than anything else out there. They saw that this was really, really successful, so they grew the business into other key US markets, um, New York, Chicago, LA, and also in 2011, pursued our first global expansion um, into Paris. In 2012, we further grew our business in uh, the United States and also pursued some more uh, interesting European expansion. But really the biggest thing that happened at Uber in 2012 is they started testing a low-cost product. Up to then, everybody had been talking about Uber Black. That was the product that we, we thought was going to be um, you know, global and have the global impact. And really, the low-cost product at that time called UberX was just a test to see, well, is there actually a lot of interest at the low-end segment of this market? 2013 saw us expand more across the US and, and Europe, but also move into South America, into Africa, and into Asia, and slowly, slowly start testing more and more markets, this low-cost product, UberX. In 2014, I think we had clearly realized that UberX was where the money was at, right? The low-cost segment of the market is far more interesting than the premium segment, um, and this was now what we were pushing, growing our business um, you know, in, 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 in all the markets where we were, we were operating around the world. In 2015, also another big year of global growth. I think the really interesting thing about 2015 was that despite our business starting in the US, despite us operating across many, many markets in the US, 2015 saw our international business overtake our US business in terms of total weekly trips for the first time. This company that had started in the US developed, right at the start at least, a very US-centric view, quickly realized that, well, the US is an interesting and a big market, but there's a lot more out there, and the international business is actually really, really interesting. Um, so, so the focus has definitely moved a lot more to making sure that this product works in many, many markets, in many different scenarios, um, and, and can be expanded effectively across the world. This is a really interesting slide. It looks at New York, our, one of our fastest growing and most successful markets uh, at Uber. And what you can see are the light blue dots, indications of people opening the Uber application looking for a ride. And there's consecutive timestamps of these instances here in the slide, starting in 2012 and ending in 2015. What you can see is in 2012 covered a lot of rides obviously taken out of downtown Manhattan, but as time progressed, the density um, and the coverage of the business increased significantly over this market. And I think this, this, this impact of scale is really fundamental to what makes Uber's business model successful, right? And they're really, they're, they're two important parts that the scale brings. The first part is efficiency. When you've got a vast number of riders and a vast number of drivers in a small space, 
all connecting with one another. Um, what we look at as our measure of efficiency is essentially waiting time. How long riders are waiting to take a trip or how long drivers are actually waiting to take, uh, take a client. The longer this waiting time, the more inefficient the system, the worse the rider experience, the less money the driver makes. Conversely, obviously, when you bring that down, the whole system becomes a lot more efficient. So over this period in time, the system in New York became tremendously efficient, right? I think today you're looking at around about an average waiting time of two minutes um, to catch a ride um, in New York. The second really, really important aspect of the scale is coverage. I think what you can see here is that at the start we covered downtown Manhattan and yes, that was interesting. We were offering something a little bit different as, uh, you know, uh, to what was there, but there were many alternatives available in Manhattan, right? Uh, people could take taxis and, uh, and, and, and many other ways of getting around. But slowly as our system scaled and expanded, um, you can see that we actually cover the whole of New York area. And I think the interesting thing here is that today we are covering many, many areas in this, in this city that were previously vastly underserved by alternative, well, by other transportation infrastructure. That meant that everybody staying in the outside essentially had to own their own vehicle um, or, or, or share a vehicle with somebody else. Now, now, the fact that Uber is covering these segments of the market doing so at a really low cost and doing so efficiently means that, well, more and more in New York and in many other markets around the world, the need for car ownership is really, really uh, uh, declining. It's worth talking a little bit about our time in Europe. It's a really interesting uh, market for us. Um, as I'd mentioned before, we launched in Paris our first European market in 2011. Um, and today, we're in more than, uh, more than uh, 50 cities across the, con um, across the continent and, and have a really, really interesting business uh, operating here. And I think our European history is, 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 is one of two, two very, very distinct chapters. The first part of it is quick, aggressive growth, real American-style expansion, right? We, we knew we had a product that was fundamentally better than anything else out there, um, and it was our essentially it is our uh, responsibility to bring that product to as many markets as quickly as possible. Well, that expansion strategy worked really well in the US, but it really didn't actually uh, didn't in Europe. It, it grew in some markets, but over time we saw more and more resistance and we actually did a lot of damage in, 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 in the region um, uh, and, and faced a, good, a, a number of really, really big challenges. I think what's, what's interesting is that we realized this we, we took, a, took a step back and, and decided, well, we need to think about things very differently here, right? We need to take a different approach. We need to engage stakeholders on a much more effective basis and, and, and work towards a long-term uh, scenario where our model can operate um, within the various regulatory frameworks within the European uh, continent. And uh, since we've done that, we've seen some really, really interesting successes. One is our business in London. We've got more than 25,000 active partner drivers on our system in London. We've got more than 1.2 million riders uh, who are actively using our system uh, in London. A real great success story, and it's, it's, it's a market that continues to grow and continues to be one of our biggest and most important. The other ones are a little bit closer to home. So as you know, Uber is an interesting example of, in many instances, innovation leading regulation. And what's really important is that if you're bringing a product like this to the market, yes, it's great that riders and drivers are using your service, but you also do need to work towards some long-term sustainable regulatory framework. And we're doing that in both Estonia and Lithuania, where, where there's really interesting, very, very forward-thinking um, uh, ride-sharing legislation um, in the works there. And, and we're really excited about the impact that that's going to have. The third great success, and um, I think the one that I'm most excited about personally is the success of our Polish business. So we launched in, in Poland um, in August of 2014 in Warsaw, and I think, you know, if you look at it relative to the rest of our global expansion, it's fairly, um, you know, it, it's fairly late uh, compared to other European markets that we launched. And I don't think we could at all have envisaged the fact that Poland would be such an interesting, such a fast-growing, such an exciting market for us. In Poland today, we've got more than 300,000 registered users, more than 40,000 drivers that have signed up on our system trying to drive on the, you know, interested in driving on the Uber platform. And in Warsaw alone, we, saw, we see more than 10,000 downloads on the application every week. 
This is an interesting chart that shows in the first 12 months of various European cities that we've launched, the number of active drivers working on the platform. What you can see here is that the growth in Warsaw far outstrips other key European markets, right? Far, grows, grew far faster in the first 12 months than London did, did, did in its first 12 months, far faster than Paris did in its first 12 months, um, and, and many other European markets. So it's really clear, and, and it became clear to us, I suppose, um, when we started seeing this, uh, this trajectory, that Poland is a market that we need to be in um, and one that is critically important for us. Um, I think if you look at our European business as a whole, um, you know, uh, our business in Poland stands easily within the top three most important businesses, uh, markets uh, in the EU region, uh, right next to the UK um, and France. And yet, there's still a number of markets, at least on, up until today in Poland, that we still haven't covered, right? Um, Katowice in the Silesia region, uh, we were really interested and surprised, actually, um, when we pulled this data. And basically, what you're seeing here is a, um, the map of uh, Katowice and, uh, and the surrounding areas. And every blue dot there is an instance of somebody opening the Uber application looking for a ride. We're not operational, well, at least not until today, we weren't operational in, in, in this market. Same thing for, for, for Woods, right? Uh, lots of instances of people opening the Uber application looking for a ride. In fact, more than 16,000 of these, right? So when we look at these, I think, you know, this brings us to um, an important announcement that we've got in our, in our Polish business today and something that we're super excited about, really, is increasing the accessibility of Uber across Poland, right? We're doing so in two important ways. Firstly, we're launching two exciting markets, both Wuj and uh, the Silesia region, starting with Katowice. Um, and then the second piece is that we're significantly reducing the prices of Uber across the whole of Poland um, by more than 10%, also starting today. Um, and I think if you look at these two, this makes Uber far more accessible. And it, it once again reinforces that, that the, the comment around the low cost segment of the market being super, super important. And, and, and we're really interested in, and we're excited about this. I think after today, um, Uber is available and accessible by more than a third uh, of, uh, of the Polish population, which makes us extremely excited. Um, I've got a couple of slides just talking a little bit about our vision for the future. Now, now Uber as a business is all about helping you navigate your city, whether that's moving you from point A to point B, or whether that's bringing things to you uh, and, and preventing you from having to move there. So there's a couple of products that we are developing globally and, and, and are really, really interesting. And one of these is Uber Eats. Uber Eats is a platform whereby you can order, um, just like you would order a car, you can actually order a meal. Um, and just like a car would be there or an Uber would be there in minutes, this meal of yours would be there in minutes. It uses the different um, application so that uh, we can more effectively um, uh, cover the needs of, of essentially ordering a meal uh, on the platform. But the interesting thing is on the back end, it really slots into our existing transportation uh, network. Um, so just making that transportation network that much more efficient and on the delivery cost piece, making it you know, uh, one of the most competitive options around. Um, another super interesting product that we're launching across markets around the world is uh, Uber Rush. Similar concept, right? It's about moving, rather than moving food or moving people, it's about moving everything else. Um, Uber Rush is a parcel delivery, um, uh, a, a parcel delivery uh, platform, and basically it works on B2B and B2C. The idea here is that if you've got a great idea, um, you've got a product to sell, a physical product, you know, today you set up a website, uh, you can sell that product online, still delivery is a, a big pain point as part of that process. Uber Rush looks to, to ease that delivery pain point significantly and to bring that delivery cost down uh, drastically. And we're really excited about the impact that'll have. But this is the product we're most excited about. If you look at this image, right, if you caught it at the start, basically what we had is two separate trips. Moving two, um, you know, two, two separate trips, essentially starting at the same place or a similar place and ending at a, at, at a similar destination. What would happen if you could combine those two trips and basically use one car rather than two um, uh, to, do this, uh, to do this trip? And really, this is, this is a product called Uber Pool um, uh, that we've been testing now for, for over a year in, in, in some of our markets, and it is extremely exciting. 
it's got um, a lot of really interesting implications, right? Because what you can see here is that, well, as soon as you can't, as soon as you halve the number or halve the number of cars that you need to have on the road uh, to do trips from point A to point B, you have a tremendously positive impact on congestion, um, on pollution, on the need for parkades, on the need for car ownership. And uh, that's exactly what, what we look to do with Pool. So interesting on, in, 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 um, in, on this slide, what you see is on the one side, if all trips were to be done separately over a specific period of time, the more yellow the image is, uh, the more tr dense the traffic is. Well, what if you combined a lot of those trips and did them through Uber Pool? It's obvious that it's far more efficient, far less traffic, far less congestion, something we all need in our lives. Now, Uber Pool, I think one of our test markets here is Los Angeles. Really, really interesting, right? Um, we launched Uber Pool in uh, Los Angeles more than eight months ago. And, uh, and in this short period of time, we've done more than five million trips on um, uh, five million Uber, tr uh, Uber Pool trips in this market. Insane. That means more than 150,000 gallons of gas saved more than 7.9 million miles of drive, driving saved, and more, point, more than 1.4 million metric tons of CO2 emissions uh, prevented. What we're seeing now is that um, around about 20% of Uber's global trips that are happening are happening on Uber Pool. And we've only got, launched this product in 33 of our markets. Obviously, we will, as, as we perfect and we uh, continue to improve this product, we'll look to expand it to more and more markets and having a much, much bigger impact um, on, the, on, on the transport networks uh, around uh, cities around the world. I would really like to see us, uh, you know, looking at the, the, the awesome trajectory that we're seeing in our Polish business today, I would really like to see that, uh, you know, would, would really like to see that us, that we could launch something like Uber Pool here maybe in the next 12 months, let's see. The last part is just sharing some, some personal takeaways. Uh, I mean, I've been at Uber now for, for a few years. It's been an amazing experience. Um, and, I sit and, and I sit and think back often to myself, like, what is it that's made this company so, uh, so successful to date? And, and what is it about this that, that makes us feel that we can back ourselves to meet the, the, the ambitious targets that we've got set for us in the coming, per in the coming uh, few, uh, few years? Now, I sort of identified two, two, two key things uh, that I think are important, right? The one is choosing right people. I know, super cliched, but it couldn't be more true. When, when Uber launches markets around the world, we do so typically with two to three people. Now, these teams of two to three people essentially run their own startups in every city that they operate in. Um, and they'll run those own startups in the cities that they operate in um, and, and scale them to a, you know, to, a, you know, to, to a fairly big level doing more than uh, you know, tens of thousands of trips every week before they actually scale and build and, and, and develop those teams further. That obviously means that in your team of two or three, every single person on that team needs to be a rock star. So I started uh, in, it, at Uber late in 2013. I launched our uh, business in Cape Town to start, and, and those are, you know, we're with, with that, that team of two rock stars there uh, on the left-hand side, left-hand side, um, you know, we managed to grow the Cape Town business into one of the most successful, most efficient businesses at Uber in the whole of the EMEA region. On the right hand side, we've got one of my, you know, the newer team that I'm part of, which is, uh, you know, our Polish business. As I mentioned, right, so as of today, we're in more than, well, we're in nine Polish cities. These guys, these, these handful of people are, are managing tens of thousands of trips uh, in, in the market every week um, and growing and running essentially one of our most exciting businesses in the EU. The second one is about making big bets, right? Incremental change is interesting and, uh, you know, it, it adds value, but, but really only incre incremental value. The only way that you run and develop and, and expand a business as successful as, as Uber is by taking really, really big bets and then putting all your efforts and all your talent and all your energy into those bets. I think one of the interesting ones is the business in, uh, our business in, in South Africa, right? Um, I, we, we started in South Africa in 2013, and it was interesting because if you look at the, the relative uh, Uber's, well, the relative trajectory of Uber's global expansion, it was an interesting market uh, to, to enter at such an early stage. At that stage, there were already many clones operating and, and doing what we were doing, but none of them thought that the South African market was remotely interesting. And 
even the people that we were talking to as we launched, as we started our business there, thought that Uber was crazy to be operating there. They, th they said that nobody takes taxis, everybody owns their own cars, um, nobody would ever put their credit card information uh, into an application, this will just not work at all. But I think as a business we saw that there was an underlying need that was far more interesting, right? A complete lack of public transport infrastructure and we saw the opportunity to come in and, 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 and develop that. And uh, over the short period that we've been there, uh, the business in South Africa has been one of the biggest success stories um, around Uber, right? We've got more than 4,000 partner drivers in the market there. We run, more, we run five cities and are expanding quickly. And we've traveled more than 93 million kilometers on the system there. So something that we're super proud of. Um, and it's these kind of big bets, you know, that, uh, that we want to continue making around the world. It's bets like this, it's bets like Uber Eats, it's bets like Uber Rush, um, uh, and, and most importantly, Uber Pool, that we think uh, will help us meet our super ambitious targets uh, over the next few years. Thanks. Um, uh, that's it for me.